Okay. Good evening. I'm Ann Thompson, the Assistant Director for Public Services at the Essex Library, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's presentation, There's More to the Messenger, the Wonderful World of RNA with Yale Science Communications. My co-host tonight is Holly Nelson, Development and Events Coordinator at the Hotchkiss Library of Sharon. Three housekeeping requests tonight. Please keep your microphones muted and your cameras off and go ahead and put your questions into the chat box as they occur to you and we'll get to them after the all the presentations. And right now, please welcome Caleb Gordon who will introduce tonight's uh, event coordinators and speakers. Hey everyone. Uh, so thank you all so much for joining us today. So we are Yale Science Communication, a graduate student organization that seeks to ignite scientific curiosity and uh, just scientific joy across various libraries in the Northeast. Uh, and it is my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, this talk. Uh, we have a fascinating, uh, fascinating series of talks for you today uh, about RNA. Uh, and I believe the uh, coordinator for this talk, Olivia, will get us started. Our thing. Thanks, Caleb. Yeah, so uh, as Caleb said, I'm Olivia, and I'm so excited to be introducing our talk tonight on There's More to the Messenger, the Wonderful World of RNA. So you'll be hearing from three speakers tonight. Uh, first, we'll have Rami, who is in the Department of Chemistry and researches the dynamics of protein and RNA interaction in the spliceosome, and you'll understand a lot more about what that entails after her talk. Uh, and a fun fact is that she loves listening to podcasts. Next, we'll have Mikey, who's in the Department of Microbial Pathogenesis and studies SARS-CoV-2 structure and pathogenesis, and has a very pink guitar. And finally, we'll hear from Matt, who's in the Department of Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry and studies the misfolding of tumor suppressor proteins in cancer. And Matt's fun fact is that he loves to play soccer. So before I let the speakers take it away this evening, I wanna give you a brief introduction on RNA and why we should care about this topic tonight. So as you'll hear from our speakers, RNA can impact really, uh, really strongly many different aspects of our lives. So we'll hear about ways the RNA can be responsible for really debilitating diseases in humans, as well as uh, mosquito-borne in, uh, infections like viruses. But the news isn't all bad because RNA can also be an important uh, component of life-saving vaccines, like the recent Moderna and Pfizer mRNA vaccines that I'm sure you've heard a lot about. So what is RNA after all? Well, to talk about RNA, we have to first think about DNA. So your DNA is the material in each of your cells that contains all the information that makes you who you are. You can think of it as a giant instruction manual. And like any instruction manual or encyclopedia, it's made up of these tiny individual letters. So this instruction manual contains all of the information you need, uh, like an IKEA uh, manual, to build these molecular machines called proteins. And these proteins are responsible for almost all of the functions that your cells in your body have to uh, carry out. They're uh, working hard in every single cell in order to keep you, uh, keep you running. So what we think of as the central dogma of biology is that DNA makes RNA makes protein. So RNA is in fact this bridging molecule between the DNA instruction manual and the protein molecular machines. So DNA and RNA are very similar in that they're both made of these letters, which we call nucleotides, and they can bind to each other specifically and carry information because of these similar letter languages. But one big difference is that DNA is double-stranded, whereas RNA is only single-stranded. So the process to get from DNA to RNA to protein has two main steps. The first step is called transcription, and this is uh, the transition from DNA to RNA. And you can think of this as transcribing one set of letters to another set of letters, but it's still in a very similar format. 
Step two is called translation. And this is where RNA is converted into protein, these molecular machines. So this is, you can think of it as being a little bit further to go. You're translating it into a whole new language of these proteins. So with that introduction, I will uh, give you a brief preview of what our speakers are gonna talk about. So first, Brahmi is going to start us off with the science behind how the RNA in your cells is processed to make you who you are and how this might go wrong. She'll show us that even a tiny mistake in this intricate uh, process can lead to drastic consequences. Uh, next, following along this RNA molecule, Mikey will take us on a historical tour of how RNA can be used against us by viruses like yellow fever. He'll explain the massive impact that these viral RNAs can have on human health, as well as the, the gritty details of how the scientists of yesteryear made discoveries that still impact us today. And finally, down here, we'll hear from Matt, who will open us to an even wider world of RNA by explaining how these tiny messengers can be folded up like origami to become tools of all kinds. He'll tell us about how your cells are using these tools naturally right now, as well as how scientists hope to harness them for the technologies of tomorrow. And with that, I'll pass the screen off to Brahmi to start us off. Thank you, Olivia. I'm gonna start sharing my screen now. <coughs> so hopefully you guys can see this. Okay. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking to you about a message with a typo and its long-term consequences and how RNA is central to this story. So we've all um, heard about DNA and the double-stranded helix and how it um, is very important to biology and uh, the fascinating features of DNA. But today I wanna sell you the story of RNA and its importance to molecular biology. So today I think hopefully if you're getting one thing out of this is uh, how important RNA is to proper functioning of all of us and how in some ways more than others, it is an RNA world. So you're kind of going to see this um, constantly throughout our talks today, but we're going to refer to the central dogma of molecular biology. Um, briefly, I kind of want to uh, touch base on this and say that um, we've kind of seen how DNA holds the genetic information of life, um, and it's needed for this production of a molecule known as RNA, and RNA is made through the process known as transcription. RNA essentially goes out of this out of the nucleus and then makes and carries out these functions. Um, and it is needed for the production of proteins, which is very important um, for proper functioning of our bodies. Everything in our bodies require proteins and without proteins, we wouldn't be here. So messenger RNA is really important for the production of proteins. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about RNA in the context of hutchinson guilford progeria syndrome. So how is RNA central to this? What is hutchinson guilford progeria syndrome? What are the symptoms? What are the complications? Are there any treatments, et cetera? So here you see an 11-year-old girl and a six-year-old boy with hutchinson guilford progeria syndrome. It's a genetic condition that is quite rare and about one in eight million people get it, but it is characterized by dramatic and rapid appearance of aging beginning in childhood. So um, oftentimes you see um, thinning of fat, uh, thinning of skin, loss of uh, subcutaneous fat, uh, rapid hair loss, uh, unable to close your eyes all the way. Um, and then you have very um, big complications as a result of this disorder. Uh, for example, increased risk of cardiovascular disease, you have increased risk of stroke. Um, 
uh, increased uh, uh, shortened lifespan. So the average lifespan is about 14 years. Uh, recently, HGPS did make headlines uh, in January of this year uh, when a YouTube star uh, actually passed away from HGPS, but she, um, she raised awareness and um, um, it is unfortunate that this is a condition that a lot of people are still dealing with, but today I'm going to be telling you about HGPS and how RNA is central to HGPS and the reason why it occurs. So let me refer back to the central dogma of molecular biology. We've um, seen double-stranded DNA that houses the genetic information of life and it produces RNA, or more specifically, messenger RNA, um, that encodes that information uh, needed for proteins to form. Now, this messenger RNA is going to be uh, done through, made through a pro process known as transcription. And this is kind of going to be the focus of my talk today. So how is this process linked to HGPS? This is what I'm going to be talking to you about. So think about this DNA strand, the double stranded DNA that carries these letters that have information. Now, through the production of protein, you have a protein coding read uh, th through the product uh, through the process of transcription. Excuse me. You have a protein coding region known as exon being formed, which is the mRNA itself the mRNA houses the messages required to make proteins. And so now you see this link of uh, small building blocks of proteins known as amino acids that then are made because of this messenger RNA. So protein coding regions within the mRNA are going to be known as exons. Now, when DNA is then processed into messenger RNA, uh, there's this part known as pre-mRNA, and it has certain unnecessary information. So think of this strand of messenger RNA. It has some unnecessary information, but some necessary information. So the color-coded regions that you see here are the protein-coding regions that are necessary to make proteins. What is not necessary are the black regions right here. They will be known as introns. So in short, these color-coded regions, these letters, are necessary for the production of proteins and are known as exons. And the unnecessary information in this case are going to be known as introns. When, well, we have removal of those introns and then we have some sort of processing, then we get production of protein in the step of translation. So it goes to show that unnecessary information upon processing of messenger RNA must be removed because um, you cannot have that uh, intron regions in the final sequence for the production of protein. And this happens through a process known as RNA splicing. So in sum, you have a single uh, double-stranded DNA molecule that houses both exons and introns, and that gets processed into pre-mRNA. And after that, we have a process known as RNA splicing, and you get removal of the unnecessary regions known as the introns. You have gluing or ligation of the exons upon RNA splicing, and then you have this mature messenger RNA that you're looking for. This is then used to make proteins during the step of translation. So um, using this step, actually, what's interesting is we can generate protein diversity through this process known as alternative splicing. So RNA splicing, is the same process where you have removal of the unnecessary information and gluing together of the exons. Uh, alternative splicing is just going to use that series of protein coding uh, regions, these exons, and generate quite diverse variations of these uh, exons to then make 
diverse combinations of different proteins. So you can see that we've essentially glued together uh, exon coding regions 1, 3, 5 to make production or uh, to make protein 1. Uh, exon co protein coding regions 2, 3, 4 to generate protein 2 with a slightly different function. And then protein 3 is then generated from the ligation of exons 1, 2, and 5, all from the same messenger RNA strand. So you can see that we're using um, this, this process to generate protein diversity, and it allows us to come out with proteins of different functions, which is very unique and critical for um, eukaryotic organisms such as us. This process of RNA splicing and alternative splicing is carried out by a mega machine. It's known as the spliceosome, and it has several hundred molecules, um, so proteins and RNA molecules within the spliceosome to then carry out this very complex um, process known as splicing and RNA splicing. So in short, what you actually have going on is the end goal here is to remove this unnecessary uh, information known as the intron and ligation of the exons. So the spliceosome, what it does, it is recognizes certain regions of the, the molecule and binds to it, removes it, and glues the necessary exons together. And that results in formation of proteins. However, at this step, the possibilities for problems are endless. So generally, we have a lot of um, neurodegenerative diseases associated with alternative splicing. And this is kind of to just show you where we can go wrong. For example, what happens if we have a mutation within the spliceosome itself? Like the machinery doesn't have all the necessary parts required to function properly. We can have diseases as a result of that. Then imagine if we have a, a mutation in the sequence where the spliceosome binds. So the spliceosome is not going to recognize where to bind and where to cut. If it can't cut out the intron, it's going to remain in the final product, and that's going to result in severe problems. Then imagine if you have mutations within the protein coding regions themselves. So you do carry out the process of RNA slicing, but then you can't have the normal protein being produced, which means you have um, mutations in exons 1 and 2 and mutations in the protein which means the protein is not gonna be able to do its job that it's supposed to do. So you can imagine that these are a lot of different um, paths for errors in alternative slicing, which is very important for, for processing of proteins for us. And it happens all the time in ourselves. Um, today, I will talk to you about what happens in the context of HTPS and how RNA is uh, associate, <coughs> associated with that. Um, before I dive into that, I do want to tell you a little bit about what the spliceosome requires in order to kind of carry out this process of splicing. It requires two uh, locations. So the five prime splice site and the three prime splice site, those house some certain nucleotides or sequences that are required for the spliceosome to recognize where to start splicing, where to join, where to cut, where to finish the process. And so uh, you can imagine if there are mutations in these splice sites, then we can run into um, problems. In the case of Hutchinson-Guilford progeria syndrome, what we do have is imagine here you have the normal five prime splice site, uh, in HGPS, however, there is a mutation that actually results in the wrong five prime splice site being selected. So it imagines that instead of the normal splice site, it's actually going to start binding here and cutting there. So part of exon 11 was deleted. The part of the protein coding region exon 11, not all of it is generated and uh, processed, which means after ligation, now you have this truncated exon 11, which 
results in this mutant protein being formed known as progerin. And that's really the cause of the issue here. Um, it is uh, important to show you what actually happens, what that single nucleotide mutation is. So here we have a completely normal uh, exon 11. Because of a wrong cryptic uh, five prime slice site being used, now you kind of have um, a ligation to this, and then you start kind of um, cleaving this region altogether. So that means you have a shortened exon 11. And the root of it is this DNA sequence. So in exon 11, you have um, this GGC, which is the normal version of the code. However, in the mutant version, what actually happens is a substitution. So it's GGT instead of that C. And that results in these um, a variety of issues that I just showed you here, which means part of exon 11 was deleted and not made into the protein that we would want to see. That results in that mutant protein being formed. Um, and that is because of that wrong five prime splice site. Um, so this mutant pro Pro protein progerin is going to result in severe consequences down the road. Um, so what does that mean? So in essence, the normal protein that is formed is the lamin A protein, and it is required um, for uh, intact cells. So the nucleus of the cell is going to remain strong and intact because of la uh, this lamin A protein. Well, you have this pre-lamin A protein that is processed, and then it results in the final production of that lamin A protein through a series of steps. And then you have these healthy cells that are made. They're uh, good to do cell division and carry out the necessary functions that they need to carry. So a perfectly healthy cell is formed. In the case of the mutant version and in the, the, the reason why we have HGPS is because now we have that truncated exon 11 protein coding region, which means we have this protein known as progerin formed, which means we don't have the processing of that protein. For example, we needed processing of pre-lamin A to make lamin A. In the mutant version, we don't have that processing. So there is no lamin A protein formed. The cells have no structure um, that, that we need. And so because of that, you have accumulation of progerin, and that results in severe problems. Um, and you can see that the results and consequences are severe with rapid aging uh, in HGPS patients. There is treatment available and it's um, recently discovered a couple years ago um, or just last year, it's called Lonafarnib and it actually prevents the buildup of this mutant protein. So it is the first FDA uh, medication that was approved for HGPS. Um, so now I've kind of just showed you how RNA is central to the long the long term effects of HGPS and how uh, mishaps in the RNA slicing cycle of this protein can result in downstream large effects um, that we see here. And in conclusion, I want to uh, show I've shown you that RNA alternative slicing can dictate several splicing outcomes, generating protein diversity. HGPS is caused by a single mu nucleotide mutation, so that um, C to T that you saw, excuse me, which results in early aging and other health issues. RNA processing is important in protein production, so uh, messenger RNA is central in eukaryotic organisms. And with that, Mikey is going to sh share with you how RNA is important in um, in the history of the yellow fever virus. Thank you. Thank you, Brahmi. That was fascinating. So now, uh, let's see if I can get this to work. Share that. All right. 
Hi, everyone. So I'm Mikey. Uh, well, Brahmi talks to you about how RNA is essential for the proper functioning of your cells. I'm going to talk to you about how RNA can be an intruder in the form of a virus and really get in there and mess things up inside your body. Um, and I'll be talking about yellow fever virus today. So first, I'll start off with uh, what is a virus? So a virus does firstly composed of nucleic acid, uh, such as DNA or RNA. There are both DNA viruses and RNA viruses. And I'll be talking about an RNA virus today, of course. So this RNA is enclosed in a protein coat or capsid, which uh, protects the RNA and helps the virus attach to and enter into your cells. So lastly, uh, Another thing that makes a virus a virus is that it needs our host cells to replicate. It hijacks our cells in order to get in there, make more copies of itself, and then leave our cells left for dead and go on to infect more cells. So one of my favorite viruses is yellow fever virus. Uh, this virus is transmitted by the mosquito Aedes aegypti, and humans and non-human primates are the host species. So what does yellow fever actually look like in people? Well, first, it looks like any typical virus infection. You'll have a fever, uh, maybe headache, maybe some nausea. Um, and then a lot of people get better, but about 10 to 15 percent of people progress into what's known as the toxic phase, uh, where they can develop liver and kidney failure, jaundice, or the characteristic yellowing of the skin and eyes. Uh, black, bloody vomit, and bleeding from places that shouldn't be bled from. And people who progress onto this severe phase have about a 20 to 50% mortality rate. So some more death facts about yellow fever. Uh, there's approximately 200,000 cases and 30,000 deaths each year, the majority of them being in Africa. Uh, interestingly, in 1793, a huge outbreak of yellow fever virus in Philadelphia ended up killing more than 10% of its population. And yellow fever virus also killed almost 20,000 French workers during the French attempted construction of the Panama Canal, which eventually led them to abandon the project. So Panama Canal and Panama right here uh, in this area highlighted in tan where yellow fever vaccinations are now recommended. Uh, and that's because in this area, uh, you have lots of transmission between and among uh, primates and humans. Uh, so non-human primates uh, primarily live in these tropical areas and uh, the mosquitoes in these areas can transmit uh, you know, from the non-human primates to the people. It can be spread from people to people and even from people to monkeys, so. All right. Uh, and Controlling yellow fever was essential to the success of the United States. We really needed to get this disease under control so that we could build the Panama Canal and develop military power and facilitate trade. So as you can see here, making this Panama Canal route would essentially cut the shipping distance in half from the US East Coast to the West Coast. So you no longer would have to sail all the way around the tip of South America uh, to deliver goods on the other side. Additionally, yellow fever virus was killing 13 times more soldiers uh, in the Spanish-American War than actual combat was. So uh, for the success, economic success and military success, the United States needed to get this disease under control so they could build the Panama Canal. So the story I'm gonna tell you today is a story of science and discovery, but also a story of people who use the tools that they had at the time to try to get this figured out. Um, and I'll start with Carlos Finlay, who's the guy, he first proposed that yellow fever could be spread by mosquitoes, but nobody believed him because uh, he probably didn't have enough evidence to be convincing. Then came along Walter Reed, who performed more definitive human experiments to show that yellow fever is in fact spread by mosquitoes. Then William Gorgas was able to take this information and uh, eradicate the mosquitoes and yellow fever virus in the canal zone, eventually leading to its successful construction. And finally, Max Tyler uh, in the 1930s 
uh, developed the yellow fever vaccine that we use today. So I'll start with the work uh, from Walter Reed. So this is an amazing article, highly recommend reading if you have time, <laughs> where he did these human experiments to show that yellow fever uh, was spread by mosquitoes. So uh, he did these experiments at Camp Lazar in Cuba, and they really wanted to ask, how is yellow fever virus spread? Is it spread by fomites or objects likely to be carrying infectious material, or is it spread by mosquitoes, as Carlos Finlay had proposed? So here's a photo of Camp Lazar. You can see it's this, you know, it looks like a nice hot open field with these little huts. Um, <laughs> But they paid volunteers $100 to join the study and another $100 if they contracted yellow fever. That amounts to about $3,200 today. And they gave volunteers informed consent forms. One of the first times in biomedical research that volunteers are actually given informed consent forms to join this research study. And interestingly, in these informed consent forms, they were almost trying to convince them to join the study uh, by saying, you know, you're probably going to contract yellow fever living on this island anyway, so you might as well let us give you yellow fever, and then you can get the best patient care available afterwards. <laughs> so uh, a little bit of salesmanship in their informed consent forms. But um, yeah, so at this camp, they infected people with yellow fever using mosquitoes who had bit other people that were infected with yellow fever. And along this time, they kept very careful and meticulous track of mosquito bites when they bit uh, the infected patients, how long afterwards did they bite uh, a non-infected patient, and so on and so forth. So one experiment they did is asking, again, is yellow fever spread by fomites or mosquitoes? So they had the volunteers who were also happy to be there. Uh, be in two buildings. One Building number one was the soiled clothing and bedding building, which had poor ventilation, windows on the same side of the hut, um, and they filled it with clothing and bedding that were contaminated with blood, sweat, stools, and vomit from patients who were infected with yellow fever. Uh, the article describes it as as contaminated as possible, so um, <laughs> they made the volunteers stay here in three weeks in strict quarantine, but even in these horrible conditions, uh, nobody contracted yellow fever this way. So secondly, they had another building, building number two, the infected mosquito building, uh, which had good ventilation, a clean bedding and clothing. Uh, it's very nice, basically like a five-star hotel. Um, that's a joke, but uh, they released mosquitoes in there that were carrying yellow fever. And lo and behold, they had volunteer contract yellow fever this way. So this, along with several other experiments, really helped define the role of the mosquito in spreading yellow fever and not necessarily fomites. So one of the ways they were keeping track of their patients uh, is, you know, with the tools that they had is they could just monitor their body temperature over time. So on the y-axis here, you have body temperature, and on the x-axis is over time. And you can see as the disease progresses, you get the spikes in body temperature, uh, which seems to get better. But then uh, for this patient, unfortunately, it looks like they had sort of this relapse for possibly into this toxic phase uh, in the later stages. Okay, so with these experiments, they had a lot of good data, but they needed more as scientists often do <laughs> to show uh, what they were seeing was real. So Juan Guillotas, carried out more experiments in Las Animas Hospital in Havana. Um, and they wanted to do this in this hospital because they wanted more control over the number of mosquito bites and they wanted to give even better patient care afterwards uh, if they could. But unfortunately, when they kept going with these experiments, uh, you know, in the first round of experiments, they had 13 people get infected, but fortunately nobody died. Uh, but later on, uh, they had eight people get infected and three people die in these further experiments. So uh, a very high cost for that extra data. And one of the people who died was actually this nurse who was uh, one of the few, if not the only women woman to participate in these studies. And this is 
the fever chart leading up to her death. Okay, so we no longer carry out biomedical research this way. Uh, ethical guidelines have evolved over time, of course. Uh, and one of these ethical guidelines is called the Nuremberg Code, uh, which was actually um, developed in response to experiments that Nazi physicians were carrying out uh, during World War II in concentration camps. Um, so in 1947, the Nazi physicians were put on trial and the court actually uh, made a code for conducting these human experiments. And one of the points in this code is that no experiment should be conducted where there is an a priori reason to believe that death or disabling injury will occur. And you know, yellow fever at the time was known to be a very deadly disease. So um, by these standards, uh, it would seem that Walter Reed's experiments are uh, arguably unethical. So uh, although unethical, one of the positive things to come out of this, these experiments was that William Gorgas was able to control the mosquitoes and therefore control the disease. So uh, one of the first things they did is make hospitals mosquito proof so that when patients would come in sick with yellow fever and uh, they would be thinking twice about just opening the windows and airing things out, <laughs> you know, and letting more mosquitoes come inside and bite the sick uh, patient and carry the yellow fever elsewhere. So, you know, they made hospitals mosquito proof, uh, probably installed uh, mosquito nets and so forth. And a really important way that they did this was um, eliminating the standing water sources, which are breeding grounds for mosquitoes, and they sprayed oil or insect killing chemicals on them uh, to, you know, eliminate these breeding grounds. And amazingly, within three years, they were able to eradicate yellow fever uh, in Havana and the Canal Zone, and which led to its eventual successful construction. Okay, jumping to the 1930s and the work of Max Tyler. He was eventually in 1951 awarded the Nobel Prize for his work on the yellow fever virus. Uh, he established animal models for the virus and created the vaccine. He was also a professor uh, at Yale in the 1960s. So how do you study viruses and vaccines in the 1930s uh, with the tools that they had? So uh, they realized that you can't just keep infecting people with yellow fever for research. So you really need an animal model that can be infected and has measurable pathology. And they realized if you <laughs> inject the virus directly into the brain of a mouse, the mouse will die. And they also knew that rhesus monkeys were susceptible to the disease. So two important animal models. And the reason that if you could train yellow fever virus to replicate in a mouse, it'll replicate less well in a human. So what do I mean by that? Um, if you take yellow fever virus uh, with you know, the viral RNA from a sick infected patient uh, and you give this to a mouse in the brain and keep passaging the virus from mouse to mouse, it'll eventually acquire changes in its RNA that make it better suited to replicating in the mouse. And finally, once you give it back to a human, um, these changes that have acquired through passaging it in the mouse uh, will make it less pathogenic in a human. It's sort of like having a virus train its whole life for marathons and it'll be fast. It'll be able to run long distances, which is, which is amazing. Uh, but will it be able to compete in a weightlifting competition against Dwayne the Rock Johnson? Probably not. So the virus is just getting trained for the wrong thing. It's getting trained to replicate well in the mouse. And then it subsequently, therefore, becomes less well at replicating in the human. So this process of weakening a live virus is called attenuation. So passaging the virus through the mouse eventually mousifies the virus and attenuates it. And this, along with further attenuation steps, which I'd be happy to talk about later if you're interested, um, led to the development of the yellow fever vaccine that we use today. Now keep in mind, this is still a live vaccine. So this virus is still a live virus, although it is attenuated. So regardless of this being 
live attenuated virus. Um, this virus uh, has, is widely used all over the world. Um, it has over 600 million doses administered. Uh, it affords basically lifelong protection over 90% efficacy. And it is one of the safest, best vaccines out there. Okay, but uh, even with this amazing vaccine, um, yellow fever still lurks on the horizon uh, with over four to 500 million unvaccinated people living in at-risk areas. And of course, uh, I have to think about climate change influencing the range of the mosquito vector Aedes aegypti with a projected eight to 13% increase by 2060 to 2080. So in conclusion, uh, I hope that I've left you with that RNA can be a viral intruder which may hijack your cells and can even change human history. Further, medical research in the early 1900s was effective. They definitely got the job done, but sometimes it was crude, messy, and even unethical. And viruses will adapt to their hosts by changing their RNA genetic uh, and sometimes the virus uses it for its advantage, and sometimes we can use it for our advantage. And yellow fever vaccines are very safe. They work very well. But regardless of these vaccines, yellow fever still remains a public health threat. Uh, so with that, um, making live vaccines is one way that we can use RNA as a tool. And Matthew is going to talk to you more about how we use uh, modern technology to shape RNA into a bunch of different cool tools for um, biomedical purposes. Thanks, Mikey. Awesome, as usual. Uh, all right, so today, uh, as Mikey said, I'm going to tell you a bit about uh, RNA in our future uh, in relation to vaccines and several other amazing facets. And that can all be summed up as uh, RNA, a tool for the future. So before we can begin, I want to leave you with an analogy to think about throughout the talk that RNA, like origami, folds to take shape. And so uh, we can see that as you have a piece of paper, you can put information on it. It can uh, transmit inf that information with the written language and thus act as a messenger. However, if we fold that piece of paper, it can take new and novel shapes, such as a boat or a crane or something else wondrous. And with that, we've now given that simple piece of paper a function and because of this new shape that it has. And what's pretty astounding is that RNA does the exact same thing. So we have, and as you've seen so far, mostly RNA as a single strand here on the left-hand side. However, RNA can actually Again, like origami, fold into these wondrous shapes, such as uh, this loop here, these stacked planes here. It can twist and bend on itself. It can bind in double strands. It can bind to DNA as well. And with that, just like origami, now RNA has a new shape and a new function that it can carry out in the cells beyond just being a messenger. And so that, I think, is pretty amazing. So. I want to now show you some places that RNA has this function, but I want to make sure that we're uh, playing on the same field here with the central dogma again. I know Brahmi showed it to you earlier and said Olivia, but you know we'll go through it one more time and then again and again. So DNA uh, is transcribed into RNA and that RNA is translated into protein. That's pretty great. We know that and that's an important message for you to take away. But this picture has a lot of, uh, blank space that needs to be filled in by some pretty amazing RNAs. And we can start with long non-coding RNA. This RNA, one of its functions is to turn genes on and off, and it can do that by binding to DNA and uh, inhibit that transcription process. And as you can see here, the structure is a bunch of loops of RNA binding to itself in double strands, and it's not the single strand you saw before. And I think, to start with long non-coding RNA, this sets a, a pretty strong precedent for the rest of them, as you've known RNA as this messenger of information, but this RNA doesn't. It is long and non-coding. So that means DNA is transcribed into an RNA that 
doesn't end up as a protein or the message that will transmit to be a protein at one point. And so that, that really sets the ball rolling for the, for the next few that we'll see. There's small nuclear RNA and small nucleolar RNA, and this helps make sure that the RNA message is in the shape that can be uh, translated downstream uh, as uh, small nuclear RNA can help in splicing, as Brahmi was telling you about that before, and the small nucleolar can modify the RNA. Uh, next, we have small interfering RNA, which I'll tell you a bit about later. There's short pieces that act in this in greater concert with the machinery in your system, your cells, to degrade RNA. Next, we have ribosomal RNA, and lastly, transfer RNA, tRNA, and these are both uh, acting in concert two in these uh, ribonucleoproteins, so ribosomes and proteins acting together uh, to end up translating that RNA message into protein. And so these are, are pretty amazing machines that we see here, but again, all of them have RNA that is not a messenger. And so with that, we can move into how can we use RNA as a tool if biology uses it as a tool? And here's another analogy to think about. So we can take our molecular biology toolbox. And as scientists, we love to have some type of uh, toolbox like this that will have uh, a wide range of tools and resources for us to access and use in a wide variety of situations for us to better understand the world around us. And further understanding RNA and how it relates to DNA and the rest of the cells and how it has all these novel shapes and functions allows us to further explore the world and allow some groundbreaking uh, achievements to look forward to and that we've already done. And so with that, one of these tools is using the messenger RNA itself as part of a vaccine, as again, in the COVID-19 vaccine, as you've uh, seen plenty, but I'll explain to you some of the science behind that. Next, we have small interfering RNA, which you can analogize to being a microphone where uh, some information is trying to be transmitted, but you can silence it. So the microphone is turned off. Uh, and then lastly, and very excitingly, CRISPR in the gene editing system. And I want you to think of that as a pair of surgical tools that you can precisely change uh, those bases, those single letters that you saw earlier, uh, and create a new message or modify a message for uh, lots of wonderful applications in the world and also uh, further understanding the basic science uh, that we're interested in. So first, uh, let's start with uh, mRNA as a vaccine. So SARS-CoV-2, here's a, a representation of what we believe SARS-CoV-2 looks like. And this is the particle that would uh, can um, infect you and lead to all these downstream um, nasty, nasty cases that we've seen. But uh, one way to counter that is to have antibodies. And so when your body recognizes uh, SARS-CoV-2 particles, if we have antibodies, well, we can neutralize that particle and that can help us uh, right, uh, avoid the uh, pretty drastic effects of, of getting severely ill with uh, SARS-CoV-2 when the infection takes hold. Uh, however, as you already know, the, one of the vaccines that we can use is mRNA-based but it's not really clear outright, how does that mRNA lead to some type of antibody that we want to help us stay safe? Well, well let's go into that. So here's that SARS-CoV-2 particle again, and these blue uh, protrusions on the surface here, we call the spike proteins, and those help SARS-CoV-2 infect your cells. What's pretty astounding is we know the molecular code of what can make this spike protein in terms of nucleotides. And by knowing that, we can synthesize that in a lab and put that into an mRNA vaccine. That vaccine can then be delivered through injection into your cells. And now we have a temporary piece of mRNA encoding the spike protein in your cell. And with that, your cells, with its machinery that is already there, can go through that process of translation and that will create spike proteins. And what we've done here is we've completely skipped the transcription step, as you saw before, many times now, went right to the mRNA in the cell, translated it. Great, now we have spike proteins, right? Well, I don't, why do we want spike proteins in our cells? Is that, I thought that's part of what SARS-CoV-2 has. We don't want that. Well, it's actually quite helpful for immune system to recognize a spike protein on our cells rather than the rest of the SARS-CoV-2 particle. That way our immune system can start to generate antibodies against it. 
And with those antibodies, if you were to be infected, you have a much greater likelihood of neutralizing that SARS-CoV-2 particle and keeping you more safe. And so that's just one example. Next, we have what I like to call going silent and interfering with the messenger. So again, as I promised, DNA is transcribed into mRNA in the nucleus. And so this is just one compartment, the nucleus of the cell, where your uh, DNA, gen genetic information, your genome is held. And there's a greater compartment in your cell called the cytoplasm. Um, it is quite interesting, and we can uh, use that to our advantage to have different functions. But if not, uh, you know, don't worry about it. So DNA goes to mRNA. That mRNA is sent outside into this greater compartment. And again, we have the ribosome, as I showed you earlier, a, uh, working to translate that mRNA into a protein. And we can consider this the gene on state. And this is great. We have plenty of proteins that we want to make, and this is the process. However, sometimes there's a mutation or there's just way too much of that RNA, and we don't need the protein because too much of it can be quite bad for ourselves. It can become toxic, as too much of a good thing can often do. And so with that, we have this really amazing system that uses RNA, called the RNA-induced silencing complex, where we take that same message as we see here in this Pac-Man, and we add this small interfering RNA that I talked to you about early, earlier, and what would have been the microphone helping to amplify information in the gene on state is now going to a Pac-Man and helping to go to a gene off state and lead to mRNA degradation. And actually in 2018, which is pretty astounding, there was the first FDA approved sRNA drug for a disease that leads to protein clumps and individuals who go uh, every three weeks and get an injection of this sRNA and again, temporarily uh, help relieve the buildup of this uh, protein and uh, help what would otherwise be a very painful and debilitating disease. So lastly, we have, uh, and excitingly, tool for genome editing, CRISPR-Cas9. So in 2020, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to Dr. Jennifer Dowden and Dr. Emmanuel Charpentier for their amazing and astounding discoveries and achievements in the use of uh, CRISPR-Cas9, a tool that we consider a genetic scissors, which uses a protein, Cas9 here, that binds and binds to DNA along here, this double opened up strand, and a guide RNA, and I'll go into this diagram on the next slide uh, in more detail, to help make precise edits to the DNA and then uh, leading to downstream paths that will help modify the DNA in several unique ways that can help us lead to the applications in all of these areas here. One such example is if you wanted less gluten in a strain of wheat, well, we can use CRISPR to help us achieve that. If we wanted to modify a population of mosquitoes that was transmitting yellow fever, well, we can start to modify the genome of those mosquitoes that they um, will respond differently and uh, just act differently and have different morphologies and uh, all these kinds of different uh, examples exist. And I'll tell you more in a second when I explain more. So as I was saying, Cas9 here, this is a protein and this protein will bind to the double strand uh, or the uh, DNA that is opened up here. We can have a target sequence that we're interested in, and we need to have a target sequence we're interested that we want to modify in some way. In this case, what I'm going to show you downstream is inserting new information. So to do that, we have to have a guide RNA, and that will guide us uh, to that sequence that we want to modify. And by having a guide RNA, it allows us a world of opportunities to make endless guide RNAs that will target whatever sequence we want. And when we do that, we can uh, trigger the Cas9 system to uh, enact a cut. And so this is a simplified uh, explanation. There's a lot more uh, amazing science that goes into it, but um, generally we'll make a cut here and we have now uh, modified the genome. And that, as we see, is what I'm gonna call cut and paste. So we've cut the, the DNA at that specific location and then we can uh, provide a unique piece of information here, the donor template, and that will now be inserted into that location that we were looking at before. And so if that is not uh, already impressing upon you, uh, 
what an achievement that is. Uh, I, I need to tell you more. So again, here are the applications that we saw before in uh, industrial biotech, agriculture, therapeutics. And again, in a basic science way, we can use this tool to modify the genome and study a endless uh, you know, variety of different situations to help us understand ourselves and, and uh, you know, different organisms. Uh, one amazing feat was, is that in 2021, 2020, 2021, a uh, research group uh, used the CRISPR-Cas9 system to modify the genome of mice with hutchins guilford progeria syndrome, as Brahmi was telling you about earlier, and uh, with uh, additional machinery, was able to modify a base in their genome and extended their lifetimes. And so, and this was study was done in mice, and a lot more work needs to be done with CRISPR to make sure that this could be used on humans in that for that specific case. And uh, it is a, a long road to making sure that CRISPR can be used ethically in a variety of cases it could be used, but that's just one uh, that has started in mice. And even uh, more amazingly, it has been used uh, in the clinic on a patient who has a quite a rare form of uh, early onset blindness. And similarly to HGPS, it has a single uh, uh, mutation that leads to alternative splicing, and again, over time, that can lead to blindness. It was used in a clinic on that patient to help uh, alleviate that um, that disease, which is, again, pretty amazing. And so with all that, I want to leave you with one more message to take home, is that while we have these amazing tools and they allow us uh, to step forward into uh, the, the vast expanses of our, our future, we have to think about how the message is delivered. And this goes for how we send um, a simple piece of DNA with a vaccine or how we send a complex set of machinery such as CRISPR and where it goes. Because when we want to send a message, for example, uh, a therapy to the uh, pancreatic cells that are cancerous, they're sometimes sent to the lungs or the intestines or the delivery system is not always precise. And this goes for a wider range of therapies and tools that we use. And so making sure that they don't go to the lungs and don't go to the intestines, for instance, on a macroscopic level is quite important. Uh, not, And that's only one, uh, again, scope. It goes down into where exactly in the genome are these modifications being made when we use these tools on the microscopic level, on the molecular level. And so that is one reason why, even though we have these amazing tools on hand, it can take many years to make sure that they are used in some ethically sound and a manageable way that we can use them in humans and uh, for our health. And with that, I'd like to uh, uh, remind you that Brahmi told you about alternative RNA splicing, about how it can lead to a rich uh, array of protein diversity and how in some cases can lead to um, rare diseases that uh, we'd like to further understand and help alleviate and in, in individuals in the future. Um, but first, it takes understanding the basic science of um, RNA splicing. Uh, Mike, you told you about viral RNA and yellow fever and a, a story of people and a history of how we learn to study these, uh, you know, this phenomena and make a vaccine. And I told you a bit about how we use RNA uh, in a wide array of different uh, uses and as a tool for our future. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening and we will take questions. Thank you, Matthew, very much. Uh, this was fantastic. Uh, I, I'm just, um, I have written down a bunch of questions. I don't know, uh, and I've received a few in the chat. If there's anybody, um, Holly, if you wanted to shout out a question, <laughs> I'll, give you, I'll give you Cook's choice um, for that. Otherwise we could go to the ones that are in the chat just to be polite. Oh, you're muted. How unlike me. No, please take it away. It's all <laughs> okay. fascinating. I'm, I'm okay. happy to hear whatever more. I shared a question with one of our attendees um, about HGPS, and I may have missed it, Brahmi, but did you did you say that HGPS uh, is um, starts with conception, or is it something that comes along after uh, after a baby is born? Is there or does it happen at different times? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So it is a genetic disease and it does get passed on by the parents. So if the child receives both copies um, of the of the um, mutation, then it will have it. Um, so unfortunately, it does start upon um, upon birth. So um, as early as a few months, the baby will start to show some um, physical abnormalities, specifically uh, deformities at the head. Um, you will see some weakening of the skin, so it will not be as thick, um, fragile, I guess, skin, um, uh, poor uh, gain in hair, so like a uh, lot of hair loss, but that later shows on, not just early on, but later on. Um, so yeah. Cool. And, and Matthew, does um, the CRISPR uh, effect that you spoke about with uh, H -P HGPS, um, was that something that would reverse um, what had already happened with the disease in a patient, or would it just stop uh, the process of the disease? Oh, it's, um, I don't want to speak too uh, firmly on this. Um, I would need to refer to literature again, but it was part of uh, an additional array uh, that was used that had another enzyme, this protein that acts to reverse the base pair change. So they actually used CRISPR to modify and, and locate specifically where in the genome they uh, wanted to go. And then they had this other enzyme present that would make a, a base change. So change an A to a T, for instance. Um, and I, th I think with that, you would be able to modify um, cells that were already existing rather than the, the germline. But I, uh, again, would need to refer to their paper again to speak confidently on that. Okay. And uh, one question from uh, the audience is, could CRISPR be used to remove retinitis pigmentosa, uh, that, that gene, or, um, uh, but it obviously couldn't bring his eyesight back. It would just stop the process. Uh, so broadly, if there is a, a gene that you are interested in removing, um, there would be a process in which you would, you know, modify the guide RNA. You would you would go through uh, a screen that you would look for uh, how to best target that sequence, um, and you could remove it. But yeah, as you're saying, if this is um, widespread and there's already um, loss of vision, I, I you know I likely you know, not reverse that, but. Um, yeah, you, you could remove a gene uh, with this tool quite, I don't want to say easily, but effectively. Yeah. Caleb, did you have your hand up? <laughs> I did indeed. Um, <laughs> thank you all. So that was fascinating. Um, so I had another question for Matthew, actually kind of building off of that one. Um, so uh, uh, years ago when I did CRISPR research with zebrafish um, in like 2017, 2018, one of the, and I was like more familiar with the whole CRISPR stuff going on. Um, one of the issues that kept coming up as a limitation for research and particularly for biomedical research and the medical um, impact of CRISPR um, was the danger of these off-target effects that uh, CRISPR RNAs that were designed to mutate one gene would also mutate these other genes that they weren't uh, targeted to, were designed to mutate. Mm -hmm. um, what is the status of off-target effects with different potential CRISPR therapies right now? Well, that's a great question. And this is what I was alluding to in terms of uh, the microscopic effects of delivery. And I, I don't know the specifics on your question, on how to answer that, but some general information that I think is quite interesting and in, in, in that flavor is that there are numerous types of CRISPRs that exist because uh, it was a bacterial defense system. And so as we've learned more about um, the different bacteria that have CRISPR systems, there are more, um, than, more than just Cas9. So in terms of targeting a specific location, um, there's different efficiencies in which that's done and likely um, how that uh, ends up uh, affecting how off target they are. There's also, in terms of basic um, science and, and looking at a cell, if you're trying to insert a gene and it doesn't need to be in a specific location, there are locations in the genome called safe harbors. And that allows you to um, transmit that, that insertion 
um, to that location and uh, ideally uh, as a safe harbor, it should not uh, modify broadly the rest of the genome. Um, but again, if that has off targets itself, I, I think this is an effort to reduce that. Um, and I know in general, there are labs around the world, and I don't know if they're specifically doing that in CRISPR, but I'd have to imagine they are, where they constantly are trying to increase the um, efficiency and efficacy of the enzymes that we use. And uh, by making specific alterations, they can fine tune it to be even stronger molecular machines um, at their specific tasks. So um, I'd have to imagine labs are working toward that too in that way, but um, that's as best that I can give. I see. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. Mikey, I, I had one question. There was only one specific mosquito that carries the yellow fever virus. Is it possible um, for CRISPR to turn off the ability of the mosquito to carry that virus? Or And two, given climate change, and, and we're looking at that certainly here in Connecticut where um, it, the temperatures are coming up and we're seeing ticks moving up um, among other animals or, or, and insects, what is the possibility that um, other uh, mosquitoes will be able to also then carry the yellow fever virus as, you know, and, and uh, share it with uh, humans um, in further northern regions? Sure, so to the first question, um, I'm not sure exactly if people are using CRISPR to um, edit mosquitoes for yellow fever virus. I think this is a thing people are working on called gene drive, like CRISPR gene drive, uh, where they wanna modify mosquitoes and then promote this uh, in the mosquito population to change all the mosquitoes, um, which is an interesting ethical concept in itself too, because then you're, you know, the unintended consequences of modifying an entire mosquito population is, uh, you know, who, who knows what could happen there. Um, but yeah, it's very interesting. Lots of work going into that. Um, and then the second question about, um, can other mosquitoes transmit yellow fever? I'm not exactly sure. If, as far as I'm aware, I'm pretty sure it's mostly the Aedes aegypti mosquito, um, which actually reaches as far north as we are here. Um, and the range of the mosquito, um, you know, can sort of dictate where outbreaks could potentially occur, right? Because it's not necessarily that yellow fever is circulating around here all the time, but if somebody comes back from a tropical country into an area that's carrying the Aedes aegypti mosquito, um, and, you know, up here, I'm sure a lot of people are not vaccinated for yellow fever. Um, so people who travel to those areas and then come back, um, could introduce it into the population, especially if they're not uh, vaccinated. And that's partially why a lot of uh, countries, if you want to travel there um, down in the tropical areas, they'll require you to get the yellow fever vaccine. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Um, Holly, did you want to shout out your question? I just, I couldn't quite figure it out earlier, but I mean, the, the whole CRISPR thing is so fascinating but it's also predicated on knowing what to alter, what to get in and move around, right? Like you, you wanna replace or splice or dice or chop or mince or fluff up something. And so to my mind, there's just gotta be mountains and mountains of research ahead of time to, to, to determine if you alter you know, one component, it, it's gonna have the desired outcome, right? I mean that's gotta be pretty challenging as well. Or is that maybe part of the basic CRISPR research that the, the women won the Nobel Prize for? So uh, generally, you, like we, we know the, the genomes of, of several organisms. And by, by having that as a reference, we can uh, use that and we, we know further um, yeah, what, uh, what uh, we can modify with that. And so, uh, there are uh, other uh, uses besides, so yes, you generally would like to use CRISPR to target a specific region. However, there are broadly screens that you can use CRISPR to modify several locations at once and then study um, how those uh, modifications impacted um, the, the organism. I think, Mikey, the way that you described it is, is better than, than what I'm saying. 
usually complement what I've said with the screening aspect that you know CRISPR for. So if you, you oh, can just jump that in. Yeah, sure. So uh, when people think about CRISPR, they often think about like changing organisms, changing people, plants, like all these things. But I think the vast majority of what CRISPR is used for right now is just editing a bunch of cells in a petri dish to study um, in a you know in a dish like what does knocking out certain genes do uh, and it can be used as a screening tool too so you could design you know millions and millions of different guide RNAs to target tons and tons of different genes and then you could uh, knock out a whole bunch of them and then try to see as a screening tool like which genes are important for certain functions so that's that's a huge part of uh, what CRISPR is used for now and it that's what's really opened up uh, you know, amazing avenues, just, uh, you know, being able to figure out what genes are important for what and screen a whole bunch sure. of them at the same time. Um, and, you know, entire labs could be built off of doing these screens, you know. <laughs> so. Yeah, so it's being, it's being used to build a massive database to, to tell the rest of the, the research world how the various genomes are impacted or what they're made up of or what you how how using it can affect the outcome is that what you're saying i'd say that's yeah in part that's that's probably true yeah i mean people um you know do these huge crispr screen knockouts and then publish their data and then follow up on certain different hits that look really good and that they want to chase down and um you know this all gets published and yeah you know. how do what do you all do you all see a time in the near future at least in in your young lifetimes when when CRISPR will have kind of an everyday common use for, it'll be used in, to, you know, on a, on a more everyday basis, or it's still, I understand it's such a, uh, a, a newfound piece of uh, body of information. It may be a long time, but do you see it being used on an everyday basis at some point? Or is that not even a clear question? Um, do you mean on an everyday basis um like it is being used in labs um an everyday basis but if you mean um editing the human genome of um i mean so something something i i think might get at what you're asking is um the the ethical quandary of of using crispr to modify um, features of an individual that are they don't directly impact health such as height and um uh, various aspects eye color etc um that is a a very difficult task um one one reason is that we don't know all of the um, different pathways that lead to uh these specific what we call phenotypes or, or you know observable features of an individual and so not knowing that making one or even two changes doesn't necessarily get us to that endpoint and so that is a pretty large precluding factor there and so that's going to limit us there. But sure. in general, CRISPR is used every day in a lot of the different applications that, like currently, that I, I showed earlier, um, and uh, largely in the food industry too. So, okay. Yeah, I guess I was thinking of everyday diseases that hadn't occurred to me about height and weight and eye color. That sounds kind of cool, but like everyday diseases that you could get in and tinker around with and maybe fix. Um, but, and I certainly understand the ethical question and, and the fact that your answer. Is, is clear to me that there are plenty of places that it's in use, even if it's not in use um, in a lot of human things, just because there's ethical situations that are still being worked through. Uh, yeah, and, and, I, and I think in, in general, in disease, there's, again, the, the creation of the tool coupled to what Caleb asked about um, direct targeting rather than off targets, which can be pretty harmful. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't want to include more. And so then optimizing that aspect so then um you've made it then you've gotten it very optimized and then you need to make sure you go through um several rounds of of making sure that you could use it on an individual and then it's actual use and making sure that you're delivering it which is what i was talking about before so there's a lot of different steps and lots of time and research to make sure that it's safe so um i think it's the goal of a lot of uh you know broadly to be able to use crispr amongst other um tools that we have such as interfering RNA to help reduce the, you know, in the buildup and that disease, if you're interested, is um, transtheratin amyloidosis, which is a mouthful. But anyway, 
there's lots of diseases, maybe some that right not so common to hear, um, that we are building this, but the the while the repertoire can be large, the the use needs to be highly regulated. So uh, yeah. lots of lots of research. Thank you. That's good. Caleb, I, I see your hand up again. Uh, it is indeed. Uh, now, I don't want to keep our uh, our librarians and speakers here too late, uh, but I found that I couldn't help myself from asking this question, given that, you know, this combination of uh, on the ground experts in molecular and cellular biology are here. Um, and so I'd love to hear from each of you, including Olivia, um, about uh, the central dogma uh, and particularly so you all talk about the central dogma, and it was one of the central takeaways from this talk, that DNA is, uh, is transcribed into RNA, which is translated into protein. And we all know that that is kind of a simplified model of what's really going on. And there's a lot of different feedback and uh, exceptions to this model. Um, and so I'm curious to hear from each of you what you think is the uh, most exciting or most sort of groundbreaking uh, addition or modification to that model that's come out in recent years? It's a good question. Sure, so I could start with, uh, maybe not exactly your question, but I guess some food for thought about the central dogma is like, if you think like DNA makes RNA makes protein, you know, that can get moved around in so many different ways, right? Because what makes DNA, right? It's actually protein <laughs> or like DNA polymerase, right? It goes from DNA and makes protein. Uh, so that's an interesting concept too. And then also, you know, with certain viruses like, like HIV, which has this thing called reverse transcriptase, it actually turns RNA into DNA, um, which then gets turned back into RNA and then makes protein. <laughs> So the central dogma is actually uh, very complicated and there's a lot of different ways that it can loop back around on itself or, you know, all sorts of different things. Uh, yeah, I can go. Uh, and thank you for bringing up uh, retroviruses, Mikey. I think that's uh, super fascinating. Um, but one other thing that I think is really interesting, although perhaps not, not quite uh, recent and groundbreaking, but um, is the idea of epigenetics. So there are, uh, you have your DNA in your, in each of your cells all bundled up tightly. And some of it is sort of locked away in the center where it can't really be transcribed and translated. And some of it is more loose out at the edges where it can be expressed. Um, and whether DNA is, uh, locked away or available depends on a lot of the proteins around which this long string is wound. Um, and we've found that in fact, those, uh, those proteins can be modified uh, both at, uh, at the uh, formation of the embryo or over your lifetime. And some of these modifications can actually be inherited. So you could pass on some little bit of your lived experience to your offspring, not through your DNA, but through these um, modifications to the spools around which the DNA thread uh, is uh, is stored. And I think that's super fascinating um, that there, for, for so long, we've really had this, this dogmatic approach of all of the gene uh, the hereditary information is in the DNA genome, and there's nothing else. Uh, but in fact, there are these uh, these exceptions to some of those uh, some of those heritable uh, heritable uh, traits. Thank you. It was really interesting. That is really interesting. Um, I would like to add one interesting thing about um, something that I brought in my. Um, talk, which may be a little misleading, the idea of introns being unnecessary information and how we kind of take those out during the process of alternative splicing and splicing in general. Now, um, recently, a lot of scientists are actually thinking that introns are actually very necessary. And there's a lot of research that's being done as to why these introns are um, required for proper formation of these proteins. So I think that's a very interesting uh, path that's going to be um, 
studied in the next few decades because we know that um, normal protein functioning will not occur without processing and removal of the introns, but they are needed. Um, so that is definitely interesting. The other th interesting thing is when we talk about protein coding regions within the messenger RNA, um, uh, we also kind of imagine a certain length of these uh, exons. However, uh, to be functional and to be uh, able to be used for translation into proteins, but now there's also research showing that these these can be very very tiny um, open reading frames or um, yeah basically very small exons leading into microproteins um, which can be very functional and it was uh, undetected previously. So there's like a cutoff and it wasn't detected because the size of the protein uh, coding region was too small. Uh, but now with uh, very um, up and coming techniques, we're able to kind of detect these like very, very tiny proteins that are functional. So that's really interesting as well. Wow. Bami, you, you took the words right out of my head. I was going to explain. So there's a researcher at Yale, Sarah Slavov, who's uh, like the, the magnum opus of her work is the exploration of the microprotein, the microproteome, and um, which is exactly what Bami was talking about. And I, I think that is, yeah, her work is just astounding. Um, but but I'll give something different. I can't just, right? Um, so I am, so I, as I talked about in my talk too, it's um, the, uh, if you remember the the stacked platform RNA that, you know, I absolutely love that RNA. I think it's just a beautiful geometry. Uh, it's called a, a G quadruplex and just an amazing name too. Um, so I, it can pop up in the DNA. It can pop up as RNA. It could have functions in terms of how it affects translation. And so in, in the kind of way that just broadly we're talking about is um, into the, what is so impactful or um, novel developments and how we understand the central dogma. Yeah, G quadruplex is found all over doing doing everything in terms of how it's modifying the message that is translated. It's present in diseases. It's um, present in, uh, we can use it as a tool that will lead to um, a fluorescent molecule that we can study and can be encoded and, uh, oh, it's just, it's just so nice. <laughs> It's so nice to hear from people that are just so interested in the work that, that is, is unfolding before their very eyes. It's really great. It is, it, it's wonderful. And I'm sure much of it uh, is decades in the making. Uh, even with you guys, it, you, know, you may not see real fruit of your labors uh, for a long, long time. So thank you for uh, endeavoring to make the world a better place, uh, even though it doesn't feel like you're getting very far on any given day. Um, we're grateful. So thank you. And thank you all for uh, attending the talk and presenting your information. It's fascinating and I can't wait to look at it again. <laughs> um, uh, and, but I really appreciate the time and efforts that you put in. Uh, so thank you for coming out tonight. I wish you the best of luck in all of your research endeavors and whatever your postgraduate work takes you. Um, and Holly, thank you very much for co-hosting co tonight. Um, and pleasure is all mine. It was great. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for having us. This was a real treat. It's a real pleasure. I hope to be able to continue the series in the coming years. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you all. Great. Have a great night. <laughs>